Okay, we have a special recognition night, which always is our favorite part of every board meeting. And uh, we have a 6A state track champion um, in the house tonight, I believe, right? Daniel Harkin. Would you please join me up front? There he is. Congratulations to MHS track and field state champions. Sam Hankins, Javelin, hits his third straight state championship. Daniel Harkin, 3,200 meter. He also plays third individually in state tennis. Darius O'Donnell, shot put, and Clara Mayfield, 1,600 meter, and she also finished second in the 3,200 meter. Congratulations again to Sam, Daniel, Darius, and Clara, 6A state champions. We are proud of you. Sophomore? Are you a sophomore? Yeah. No. Oh, oh, junior. I'm sorry, junior. junior. But, but, but we'll have yeah, you two left. more, <laughs> two more track seasons, right? right. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. Um, this is the point where we uh, anybody can speak to the board about anything that is not on the uh, agenda, and anybody that wishes to speak to the board will have three minutes to uh, talk to us, and you'll be timed by our clerk. Um, anybody wish to speak to the board about anything that's not on the agenda? Seeing none, move on. Next thing we have is our uh, consent agenda. We have our minutes from June 5th and June 13th, uh, consideration of bills, uh, financial reports, uh, which is the clerk report, treasurer report, activities report, um, the HR report, um, donations and grants, Head Start and early Head Start monthly report, guidelines for professional therapy dogs in USD 3 schools, and thanks to Katrina again for bringing that to us. Uh, surplus maintenance vehicles, vehicles, and equipment disposal. And we always like to highlight the uh, donations. Uh, we have a $2,125 cash donation from Ogden Elementary PTO to Ogden Elementary for classroom supplies and field trips. $866 cash donation from Bluemont Elementary to Bluemont, or Bluemont Elementary PTO to Bluemont Elementary to build an outdoor memorial for a former student. 79,288 cash donation from the Manhattan, Manhattan Ogden Public School Foundation to USC 33 for YES funds, class, Classroom to Career, and Flint Hills Summer Fund Camp, and a $4,150 cash donation from raising Riley County Raising Riley to Eugene Field Early Learning Center for behavioral and mental health support personnel and costs associated with extended child care services. Jardine. I move to accept the consent agenda. Seconded by Carla. All those in favor? Motion passes. Dave? 7 0. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to assume. The other. <laughs> okay. That's uh, now we move on to reports. And uh, tonight we will start off with our construction update. Um, there's something in our uh, EBN for that also, I think on page. Two, I get yeah, page two of that. Oh. Please join us. Yes. <laughs> Come on. Now. Okay. It's like I'm always sitting on the ground. I, by the way, I, <laughs> as I was driving home for lunch, I saw our, the uh, mobile from mm -hmm. Cogsville Preschool heading south on Set Child Road today. <laughs> Oh, this is one Did question. you know about that yet? <laughs> well, <laughs> not supposed to know that. Oh, hey. <laughs> they forgot to get permits. <laughs> oh. Oops. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> Can you edit that out, Michelle? <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, Eugene and College Hill. So, the mobiles are supposed to be out by the end of the month. Um, so, we can start anytime we want to. Um, so what's happening with Eugene and College Hill, um, they were obviously working on design and development drawings, so we're just, um, the meetings that we had today was to further talk about 
more about um, administration areas, classrooms, and real still defining areas and what is needed, what's not needed in classrooms or the administration area. Um, so the casework, you know, sinks and stuff like that. And um, we also did talk about massing of the building. So that's what, what is the building going to look like? What's the roof lines going to look like? Um, and what is the materials that we're going to look at? So we looked at some more massing. We kind of, um, when one side of the table likes one thing, one side of the other table likes the other thing. So what can we, <laughs> so Clint worked very hard. Thank you, Clint, um, to take both of the ideas, marry them together and come up with a solution. And I think he did a really good job with that. And we all agree that it was a nice solution. Um, the profile of the building, what it's going to look like, and the roof lines and what they're going to look like. So um, he did a really good job with that. So we're going to meet on a less frequent basis just because they need to define the drawings more. And so there's going to be less questions as we go along with that design development phase. So that's kind of where we are with that. Um, Blue Township Elementary, we're, as well, those meetings are going to be less frequent unless, you know, we need to start talking a little bit more about what needs to go in the music room, what needs to go in the um, Jim. So we'll bring those groups together when we need to get more defining in those areas on what needs to be where, where is the basketball goals needs to go, or where this needs to go, or that. But we did talk, um, last meeting we did talk about what's the buffer between the commons area and the music room. So there will be a storage room between the music and the commons area. Another topic that we talked about is the main hallway that comes in the blue, in, into the school, do we want a wall between the commons area and the hallway. We discussed in great length and we decided not to. We're going to try and use movable furniture or some other aspects to divide that space if we feel that it's necessary um, and use more acoustics and dead in the sound and stuff like that. So I think that was a good common ground that we all came to. Um, and, we, and again, we just discussed more um, in our last meeting, more details of what needs to be in the classrooms, how many cubbies, how many sinks, um, and a little bit about finishes as well. And then we looked more at the massing as well. Um, Amanda Arnold, um, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but we did bid the project out. Um, bids came in success successfully, and we were able to take some alternates, but we'll talk about that um, in the business part of the meeting. So, um, and then, Eisenhower and Anthony Middle School, we did have a meeting about that today. So again, we're defining the spaces more. Um, what do we need? Casework, what do we need? Do we need a door here? Do we not need a door there? We talked about the storm shelters. We also talked about the height of the orchestra and the band room. We're gonna try and get as high as we can ceiling height. Um, we're gonna look at an 18 foot ceiling in both of those areas um, to help with the, the sound and the kids hearing and the instructors hearing and stuff like that. Um, they, they did a really good job with massing the building and making it look like it's going to fit for both sides. It's going to fit in like it was just part of the building. The addition was just part, it was, has always been there, um, I think, which is a good choice. So, um, so we worked on that today. West Campus, we're still talking up here in the 30,000 sky. <laughs> um, so we're still exploring um, options for the addition, but I think, um, we're gonna land probably on the northeast side um, and possibly not tearing down A Hall and B Hall. Um, so it's gonna save us a great deal of money um, by not tearing those down. So I think Gould Evans is working very hard on coming up with better solutions for us and coming up with more solutions that will give us more classrooms um, cool. than we expected. So um, I think that's worked out very well for us. Um, I think we're getting really good feedback for the folks that are coming to the level three meetings. Um, Carla's been there and I think we've had good conversation. And I think Gould Evans is doing a, a good job taking in that information and absorbing it and coming back out with, hey, let's think about this, let's think about that. Um, they did bring in, let's think about what's the size of the classrooms, what do they really need to be? Um, what's the average around the state? What's the average around the um, districts our size? And we kind of looking at three or 800 square feet for a classroom. And actually, ironically, a lot of the classrooms over in the main, in the building now are about 800 square feet, maybe just a little bit over that. So um, the teachers that were there at the last meeting were gonna go take a look at those and see what they thought about that. So next time we get, um, gather, we're going to see what they thought about that and kind of progress from there. So we'll have another meeting in a couple of weeks. Keith Knoll Maintenance Center, we are still, they're still working on um, drawings. Um, we did have some surveys done at the building and they're getting ready to do some uh, soil boring tests. So that should happen in the next couple of weeks. 
and um, we did finally find the sewer line. We didn't know where that was. We finally, <laughs> Matt and I were out there one day, so we finally found that. Um, so we know where that's coming out. Um, so it's progressing along, and probably pretty soon, um, probably in the next couple months, we'll probably be renting trailers and start moving out of the buildings and getting out and start sorting stuff and uh, storing stuff. So it's kind of where that is. And now, um, yep, come on up. We are going to, um, two weeks ago, we presented to Facilities and Growth on the middle school projects. I think um, we also sent out the presentation to the board as a whole to have you look at and see if there are any questions or comments and if you want to bring those up. But um, Clint Hibbs and Bob Ferris and Craig back there in the corner um, is going to present that to you, what we saw at Facilities and Growth. Okay. <laughs> Well, we're really excited to show you the progress, um, where we're at with the middle school design, uh, knowing that it's it's still things that we're tweaking here and there. But wanted to give you kind of the latest update. I think you had gotten some information a couple of weeks ago. We've kind of added to that, and we've, we've done some tweakings uh, since that time. Uh, this is, is the overall plan, and we're still looking at uh, band room and storm shelter in this area, the new wing right here, new art room right here, and then extensive renovations in what is the media center and central office area. Uh, we've also started looking at some of the some smaller, um, I wouldn't call them renovations, but smaller updates to a few of the existing classrooms as well. Um, this is kind of a larger area of the new wing where we're tying into the rec center right here. And we'll show you some exterior views of that here in a little bit. Uh, the renovations on the inside with the admin area, uh, we actually have an admin desk that kind of goes all the way across the front that has sufficient space uh, for all the administrative staff there uh, and still uh, maintains that secure entry that was, that was so important from the very beginning. And then the, the media center, uh, basically we're taking that space and we're gutting that with the exception of uh, the existing electrical room. So it's gonna, all the electrical panels stay in the same spot. We add some IT to it. Uh, and that, that really helped cut some costs trying to, or keeping that, that small part of that building there. Um, the site uh, at Anthony and, and Eisenhower both we're looking at uh, what the requirements are for fire lane and fire hydrant and kind of what all of the site amenities are. At Eisenhower, uh, we're still looking to see if there's the ability to add some parking on there because I know Eisenhower, uh, the lack of parking is, is, is a big deal. So we're trying to look at some options for that. Uh, exterior views, so this is the classroom addition. This is kind of where the science rooms are. So this is the the end of that classroom addition with the rec center over in here, the band room in there, and the existing gym kind of right in that area. Uh, more of an eye level view of what that new classroom addition looks like. And then what we're showing here is really the length. This is the existing school right here. And then this is our length, that's the storm shelter and band room. And so we, we tried to tie a lot of the elements uh, with the brick and glass uh, together with that. So it really has that uh, continuity of look in between those two. And then how it ties into the rec center. You know, the top part of this rec center is a translucent panel. So we didn't want to put that high space up right next to it. So we pulled that back a little bit. Um, that's more of an eye level view of what you'd see. So, so this, what you see in front is really a corridor. What you see behind is more of the, the band room, music room, the, the storm shelter. And then inside the courtyard is a view of that same length with the storm shelter here and corridor going around with doors into that courtyard. And that's more of an eye level view of that. So that's really, <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> that was for our meeting earlier. So no, I'll stick around for questions. <laughs> Anybody? So I will tell you that, the, oh, shoot, sorry. I will tell you that the, both the middle school principals have asked that the courtyard that's being created um, to use it similar to what the high school does 
for lunch hours, uh, overspill, uh, nice days that they can go out there and use it, but also use it as a classroom space if they'd like to as well. So that's why we're kind of really develop it. I have to ask, I'm sure you thought of this, but tonight we're approving some casework for the library mm -hmm. at, what, at the middle schools. Is yeah. that, I'm sure you, Yeah, we've been. They, Lucas they're pretty and, hardy and they can be moved. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's actually the uh, the purpose behind the bid. The stuff currently in those libraries is not mobile, freestanding, and is the same age as the building. The stuff that we're putting in is 100% mobile to make it easier to transition to the new space once it's ready. Great. What do you think you had? Great question. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Jardine. I have a question, but not about middle schools in particular. Mm -hmm. um, have you guys talked in facilities and growth or any of those small groups about um, the addition of gender neutral bathrooms with the passing of our policy? And can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so we, uh, especially in the two middle schools, we've added um, a gender neutral restrooms, but also in the pod, the three existing pods, um, they had single restrooms where we had another single restroom and we had a conversation today with um, both the middle school principals that if there is, is a need, um, that all three pods would have single restrooms in the pods that a student could use. Um, and we are doing the same thing with the new um, elementary that we do have um, a restroom that could, there are single restrooms that students could use. Yeah, good so, yeah. yeah. Yes, we are addressing that. Mm -hmm. Trina? This is a, a general question, mm -hmm. um, not particularly related to this topic, but how do we plan ahead for technology spaces or needs that we'll have that we can't even anticipate right now server rooms whatever so how are you all having those discussions so i think that's a, that's a good question um most of our it rooms are large enough that we have to add more equipment to that we can add equipment um, when we build new additions or we build new buildings um, the way we cable manage um, the it is very important so we don't just run it over the ceiling or whatever. We use cable <laughs> trays and that allows us to be able to expand um, the technology or pull out the old technology and put new technology in. So that's very important how we do that. But we don't build the closet so small that we only put what we can, what's today. We build them large enough that we can expand whatever rack that we have to put in there um, if, if need be. So yeah, we build them large enough that we can. So we can never predict what the future is going to be with IT, but we try to plan ahead that we have large enough spaces that we can add to it. So, I just want, as a person that sat in on some of those meetings, just to reflect um, a couple of things. One, to the technology question, um, at the elementary schools, you know, we're talking about where do the iPad carts go? I mean, we're we're down into those sorts of mm -hmm. details about if it's over at this side of the room or that side of the room in regards to where the sink is in regards to where the teacher's desk is. And so the teachers are giving us good feedback about where those things are best, best fit. Um, and then also again, coming back to that feedback that's coming particular to the middle school. If you have students in there now, this is just what I'm pulling up as one of the points I remembered. Um, at some of the corners of the existing building are almost like atrium. Oh, corners. Yeah. And and the feedback from the teachers was that that wasn't necessarily something that they needed in the new space or that it could be used differently. Oh, okay. I, I feel like that the teachers have given them that feedback and then that's been reflected in the designs that they've been bringing forward. So I think that um, the the feedback from the people who are using those buildings has been very useful and I think it has been been heard and in some ways it's trying to balance and find the place where those things can meet um, but it's really crucial to have it right it's been helpful you're referring to the science um, the science corners that they sounds they right. have all yes. the glass yes. and, um, they, have, so, they have the greenhouse the yeah existing the, ones have greenhouses in the corner yeah and they wanted they needed the space but they didn't need it as a greenhouse and so with the with the new addition um, we give them the space but it's not a greenhouse it's more of a building bump out. yeah so you took out all the glass yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't have a sloped roof. So it looks more just like you are going down the facade. It looks the same. So yes, we did address that. Yep. Anyone else? 
Well, on that committee, on the board, there's Dave, Carla, and Daryl, right? You guys are all. Mm -hmm. And I also want to point out, too, that I know, you know, since we've been, the last time we went through this, I had a lot of staff are involved. I know Matt and uh, Lucas and, I mean, everybody that's involved, make sure you don't burn out because it's a long, <laughs> it's a long haul, I'm sure, as you all know, and, and uh, make sure you uh, take your breaks when you have a chance. But thanks for all your hard work, guys. Yep. Okay. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. See you next time. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Wade, you are up. Okay. My first item tonight is had an opportunity to go to the Community Relations Council from Flint Hills Job Corps last month and was really impressed with a presentation by one of our partners. And they've agreed to come and speak to us a couple minutes tonight. So we've got Johnny, Gina, Alex, and Aaron. I don't think Trey's here, is he? Trey's, Trey's not here. So if I think all four of you are going to speak, aren't you? So if you, we've got four seats up here. Isn't that quite a coincidence? <laughs> but appreciate you coming up. And, you know, if you'd, if you'd relay to Trey, too, because I know he deals with student government, right? And, yeah. you know, the students out there were just really impressive. I, I know you try to instill that in them, but when I, as I was walking up, people asked me if I needed directions. They said, hi, I'm so-and-so, you know, welcome to the campus. Just a lot of things that I know you try to have them get those social skills. So uh, it was impressive. So if you'd pass that along, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Get your us. microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and if you'd introduce yourselves, Steve, that'd be great. Yes. Aaron? <laughs> Oh, oh, Aaron still have his ID. <laughs> Just in case. I, I came by to pick up uh, my, my yearbook and uh, a few other things, and apparently I'm staying a little longer. <laughs> it's good to be here. You want to work? Uh, I'm Alex Moose, a training manager, so I oversee all the trades and academics. Get your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Alex Munoz, I oversee all the trades and uh, the vocational programs and academic programs. And I'm Gina Shope, I'm the Programs Director. And I'm Johnny Taylor, I'm the Center Director. So thank you all for having us. Um, we work with young people from age 16 to 24, what we consider at-risk young adults that meet the poverty guideline, which is about 12,500 um, if they're 18 years old, and then they base it on the family income. Um, so I like to call our young people at promise rather than at risk. and just giving them the opportunity to change their lives into, I guess our mission is uh, we want to change generational poverty. And the only way we do that is by giving them the employability skills and what we call power skills instead of soft skills that they need to be successful and move out of the environment that they come from. So we work very hard at that. Uh, we also have a single parent program, uh, only one of three in the nation now. Um, so we're proud of that. A lot of our single parents come from around the nations, mothers and fathers, and I'm going to let Ms. Schultz speak to that. I'm going to try not to get in a line. I do a lot of talking all the time. Um, <laughs> so I, I, anytime we get moments or opportunities like this, I like for them to be able to speak on uh, what we do because I get so excited and so passionate about it that um, she's going to take it from me because she know I can't <laughs> help myself. Uh, but really just watching the young people grow at the Flint Hills Job Corps is amazing. And the partnership that we have with 383, where, and it's one of out of 124 job corps, it's only like three of them have that kind of relationship that we have with 383 and we exceed what they have. Um, yes. I'm blessed to be able to go around the country and uh, see different job corps and what they have to offer to the students. And I tell you, our high school program is, is top notch. Um, so I'm going to turn it over because <laughs> I don't want to step on toes, but we get excited when we talk about the young people we serve. So like Johnny mentioned, we have a single parent program and we do take uh, moms and dads from across the nation, um, but we want to serve Kansas youth. So um, one of our hopes is sharing our the good news about our program that we can get referrals of single moms or dads or young married couples who would qualify, get them into our program. We have um, a child development center on, on our campus. It's not a, a daycare, it's really a learning facility. And we want to teach um, 
our students the ability that education can give them, what it can do to open doors and change their lives. And we want to start with our youngest kiddos. And so we teach them um, everything, like Johnny said, from power skills to parenting skills to social skills. How do you introduce yourself? Do you have an elevator speech? How do you um, explain your strengths and your challenges? How do you turn your challenges um, into strengths? We, we do all of those things at the center. And I think one of the things we do very, very well, if you guys don't know this, um, our Job Corps Center is in the top 25 in the nation. We're currently rated in the teens. And that's not because we're great people and do great work. It's because our students are providing great outcomes. All of our rankings are based on what they have accomplished. And so Alex will talk to you about their academic um, tra and training programs and um, what they do. So alongside the uh, school district that we have out there, we also have the HSC, the GD program that students can participate in. But our main one is uh, uh, the school district. Uh, we have nine trades. Every job core is different uh, on what the trades they offer. Ours is about what Kansas needs, the labor market needs for Kansas. And so the two things that come up is always healthcare and construction. So we have nine, or we have nine total trades. Five of them are construction trades. I call them hard hat trades too. Uh, we have the plumbing trade. Uh, it's a program called the Home Builders Institute. They come out and teach the curriculum to the students and they leave with a pre-apprentice certificate. Uh, we have the carpentry trade. And they are union trade, so the uh, instructor is, is union, and he uh, tries to recruit students into the uh, into the union program, which is the United Brotherhood of Carpenters. And so they lead with a pre-apprenticeship in uh, UBC carpentry. Uh, we have the cement masonry, which is another union trade, and they are the Operative Plasters and Cement Masons International Association. And so. Uh, <laughs> Um, all the trades, they are anywhere from six to eight months, just depending on if a student already has a high school. Uh, if they, whatever high school program they were at, they'll transfer to our program. And if uh, whatever credits they have, we pull those from, we pull the transcripts from past schools and uh, we make sure we align them with the uh, school districts. Uh, then we have the uh, building construction technology that focuses on commer on uh, construction commercial uh, and interiors. So uh, a lot of the uh, students, they'll, they'll either choose electrical or they'll go into flame, uh, framing as their, uh, as their specialty. Uh, we have construction craft labor. That's a trade that focuses on just general construction, make sure students get those skills to where they can put their foot in the door into any construction company and be able to start off somewhere. So you know, any student that comes in, they don't know anything about construction. Uh, this is where they'll learn. Uh, in our healthcare programs, we offer the CNA, so we partner with Cloud County Community College and Cultivating Caregivers, that's out of Leonardville, Kansas, and then we have a dental assistant program. Um, through that program, they get the uh, AMCA Dental Technician Certification, and that's uh, nationally recognized, so if any of our students move out of the state, you know, they're, all, they're still eligible to take that with them and put it on their resume. And then uh, our two newest trades are welding, which we uh, partner with MATC, and that's a semester course. And then uh, we have uh, truck driving, and uh, that's a unique one. It's uh, they get a they get a CDL license, Class A, and it's uh, anywhere from six to eight weeks. So there's some specifications with that one. A student generally need to have a high school diploma, um, and they need to be at least 18 years of age, and and obviously have a driver's license too. <laughs> So I am the business and community liaison for Job Corps and when I was on the board here um, one of the things that I kind of am ashamed to admit is that I didn't know a lot about Job Corps and I knew that we that it existed I knew that it was out there but I didn't know until I started working out there um, all the amazing things that are going on and all the things that just kind of made uh, made a lot of sense and the in the time and the period that we are going through an education in the states, given the career track, the focus back on that, and some of the things that uh, we talked about this morning. We had uh, a, a great visit with Mr. Dorst and uh, Dr. Disney about some of the career technical pathways potentially we, to be offered, but um, the, the way that the, 
the system is being um, tracked beyond a, beyond a high school graduation. That's something Job Corps offers um, up to a year to with career placement and some of the things that the state board in Kansas can that I heard so many times um, envisioning while I was in your seats that have been going on and have been somewhat perfected at, at Job Corps. I wanted to uh, talk real quick about uh, strengthening our partnerships because like uh, Mr. Taylor had mentioned, this is uh, one of the few job cores. There's 126. Uh, you have a map in your email, or you will soon. I sent I sent information uh, last minute to Diane, so you could get it in your appendix, uh, hopefully, uh, eventually. And um, that that map shows where the job cores are. It shows um, where there's also everything Alex talked about the different trades the the academic achievement uh, or the uh, trade achievement reports are in there. So all the information you could possibly want is in there and also the accurate labor information that we have. So we're talking about high need uh, industrial jobs, truck driving, uh, making good money and it shows you where they're at in Kansas, what their hourly wage is, that information. But bringing back to the school district because it is 16 to 24 year olds and we do have the ability to bring in students all over the state, but they come here and they graduate as Manhattan High graduates. And that is unique and that gives people confidence that they didn't necessarily have in different ways that sometimes aren't, aren't thought about as we go through that. But seeing those graduations and, and the, we've had two since I've been there and seeing those students that have those high school diplomas and have come to football games and are wanting to be part of this high school environment, I think we have to look a little broader and just kind of consider, oh yeah, Job Corps is there and these are our students. So one, some of the ways that we've already partnered together is with the Fit Closet because we have needs and these are our students and uh, we're trying to put together a career closet where we have, uh, there's needs that, that Tracy has at the Fit Closet, but there's also extra clothes that could be used for job interviews for some of our students that are graduating. So we partnered there and then we had prom dress collection. Uh, you, uh, MHS did that and we, we did take some of those dresses off of, off of the, their hands. They had a lot of dresses and so we can have our own prom at uh, Job Corps multiple times a year. Um, <laughs> multiple proms, yes. And uh, so the last uh, couple things I just wanted to mention is when Dr. Wade, and th those packets are for everybody, there's information in there about the, the council and the different uh, eligibility, the different trades. You'll, ha you'll notice there's a lot of uh, females pictured in those construction trades because that is a very uh, important target that we're, we're attracting and some of our best welders and some of our skilled workers have been ladies graduating and going and getting paid very well to, to weld and drive trucks. So take a look at that. But um, we want to bring, Dr. Wade came out to our Community Relations Council, which is growing and great, um, but uh, he got a chance to see some of our students and we want some of our students that are in our own student government because it reminded me seeing them as this, you know, each school comes and presents to the board. Why not bring some of our student leaders to the board at least once a year and during the summer while, you know, we're in session all year uh, and provide an annual report. So instead of throwing them into the deep end, we're here to do it the first go around, but hopefully next uh, <laughs> summer or even sooner, um, you, you'd be welcoming to our student government leaders to come and tell you all the things going on at a Job Corps. Um, and then also on that note, just a little seed to plant is uh, maybe, maybe there's ways to not talk about uh, all the building and think about uh, a retreat or something to deal with, uh, with the ways Job Corps works. I know there's always ideas about retreat topics and it's fun to not always talk about bonds and building and, and things like that. So just a little seed in there if you want. We have a great facility. Come and check it out. We'll be happy to give you tours. And our students are your students, so thank you. Y'all did very well. <laughs> no, but it is, it is 25 years for me, May 15, of working at the Job Corps. And I've never showed up a day that I didn't want to be there to touch the young people that we served lives and just watch them grow. A young man called me back about a month ago. Uh, 
that was on campus when I first started. And now he's a professor at Wisconsin University. Um, and that's what it's about. That, that's truly what it's about. But I want everybody to be a part of making a difference in the Kansas kids. They are not forgotten. And I think it's important that we all be a part of this, this process of changing their lives. So thank you for having us. Thank you for being a part of the Finnegan. Katrina. If there was one or two things that you could say, some solid action steps that you would like to see a board member, board members do, what, what would that be in this year? With Mr. Dorsey, we, we had that conversation. Our truck driving program, uh, to be able to help some of the students here going to truck driving, they are coming out making forty to $50,000 a year. Those are what I call game-changing opportunities that move that young person out of poverty into the next level, to give them an opportunity to see something different, to move into a different neighborhood, to see another doctor, to see a lawyer, to see that I can, and then to reach back and show others. So I would love to be able to have that opportunity to partner up and see how we can help the students here. And the other part is Aaron was saying, I started in recreation and our philosophy Everybody participate, everybody. If there's a young lady, if she was 400 pounds, she was getting a cheerlead outfit. If she wanted to be on the dance team, she was going to dance. If a young man never played sports before, they was gonna be a part of it. Everybody have something that they wanna be a part of. So if we can bring them over here and be a part of what Manhattan is doing to be able to participate or to just be a fan, um, and enjoy the excitement at Manhattan High School that, because if you don't stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. So just to be a part of that would be great. Anyone else? Well, I, I know I've suggested several times that we had a board retreat out there. Yeah. So yeah, maybe we can make that happen sometime. Kurt. Yes. Couple questions. I like to ask questions that I don't know, and so I'll go ahead and ask them because I'm going to assume somebody else doesn't know it as well. Um, do we have, so first question, I think maybe more to you. Um, are students that are working on their high school diploma, are they concurrently taking the classes that are their trade classes? Are they doing those both at the same time? Yeah, we have an A and B week schedule. So one week is trade, and then the next week is high school. Uh, that's how it starts off as a base, and then as time goes on, maybe uh, uh, two weeks trade, one week of high school, or maybe uh, two weeks of high school, one week trade, just depending on what the better outcome with a student is. Okay, and then my second question I think goes to you, that we have a, you have, you have the Child Development Center. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, school age kids there very often? And do they attend our schools then, obviously? They do. Um, they're bused to Ogden Elementary. Mm -hmm. So they are part of the school district. And we've had kids up to eight years old in our program. Um, and their parents still qualified for our program. So yes, we do that. And we, we also try to make sure that um, their children are um, eligible for after school activities um, or summer camp or whatever it happens to be, Boys and Girls Club, that because they benefit from those social interactions um, and seeing other parents parent um, those are so beneficial and you can't even put a dollar amount on it you can't teach those things they are modeled by other people so to us they're critical for our parents to be able to see and and be involved in and exposed to so yes great and then my last thing I think I'm looking at Erin on this one again talking about women the women that are um, young women that are serving there recently did a community service project at the um, Wonder, Wonder Workshop. Workshop. Sure. Yeah, that was great. It was nice to see, and I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the, so there's uh, there's multiple ways. Uh, we talked about power skills and, and building that well-rounded person, right? So giving back, and and uh, I, we actually also talked about partnering on the Johnny Cobb with uh, some of the construction people, some of the build and the concrete there. So that's another thing as you as community leaders and you guys kind of are in different areas like Dave is always you know involved in biking might might need uh, volunteers for races we need uh, community service for our own students it's not you know it's it's basically a requirement that we're asking them to, to serve and give back in the communities in Junction City too um, but we did Juneteenth and we partnered with uh, 
the, uh, the, the, the Manhattan habitat area habitat for humanity for that women build event and built a playhouse, but, uh, kind of opening the door. There's also a program that is through Job Corps called Y2Y, and that's youth to youth, um, that is really promoting nonviolence activities and anti-bullying, uh, reducing things like, uh, and learning about gun violence, learning about those things and talking about it within their own circles and building leadership. So um, there may be other opportunities that that thing that you think about with that. That was something we did with Juneteenth as well. We have our plumbing students. They also participate in the Wamigo Aquatic Center. So they were out there building that too, all the duct work. That's, we believe in our students giving back. It's not a handout, it's a hand up. And so having them be a part of community changes the way they think. So a lot of times our students come understanding how to fill your free time when you offer work, it's important to know how to get involved in their community. So we believe in having them go out and work in the communities. So they built, uh, Bergman had a uh, playground for the disability kids that couldn't play. So the wheelchair bound, we built that playground for them. So, th and that was, that was, that hit our students in the heart. Uh, but they love doing those kind of things. So if you have any ideas or suggestions, please get with Aaron because we believe in putting them out in the community and giving back. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Sharon. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Well, next up for me would be a uh, couple reports from Eric. Uh, Aaron, this is here's some more construction things. But if, if Eric, if you just if you talk, you know, he and I talked about this a little bit earlier today. If you'd go over the Kirkwood connection with the city, uh, up, update on the Woodrow Wilson parking, and then about well, the where we're at with the committee and the naming of the new elementary could be good. And Very good. I wanted to walk these guys out. So. All right, I, I'll work backwards from there. Um, we, we were able to put together a small group to take the over 800 suggestions we had for naming of the Blue Township Elementary School that we've been working on. So part of our process was getting a committee to narrow that down to a more reasonable level for the facilities and growth and to bring back to the board um, some options. So from our board, uh, Mr. Dean is going to chair that committee with us. So we, we've got that rolling. We'll get them meeting together within the next few weeks or so, and we'll get that narrowed down. Still hoping to have a name this fall. Uh, probably intend to do that in conjunction with groundbreaking when that would take place, which is also scheduled to take place this fall mm -hmm. as well. So we're excited about that. I think we got a good team put together for that. Um, the other thing was a Woodrow Wilson parking, just to update you guys, when we bought the lot on the corner of Osage and 6th Street, right. is that right? Um, intended to be a parking spot. We had to go through some, jump through some city hoops. We had recommendation from city officials, but we had to go to, I can't remember what the zoning board was. Carlin, do you remember? Urban Planning Development Board which we did not get a recommendation passed out of that group. We as actually a tie vote and we had, they had members gone. So that goes to city commission next Tuesday, um, which we'll need a favorable vote from the city commission and able to proceed with our parking, um, parking lot at the corner. Um, there, there was some resistance from um, a few of the area residents. I don't want to say neighbors because I don't think it was anybody that was a necessarily a neighbor to where the parking area is. But I think we have a good plan. I think our plan is sensitive to what's going on and it meets the needs and it saves play space on the Woodrow Wilson block. So I still think our plan is good, but I, I do believe um, we'll, we'll have some community members there. We'll have some of those neighbors there. And I'm certain we'll have some of our teachers, faculty, and parents of Woodrow Wilson there at the city commission on Tuesday trying to get approval for that. So just wanted to update you guys where we were on that. And also, coming up to the City Commission next Tuesday is uh, the city is progressing on um, designs for a Kirkwood extension, which is basically a connection piece from Walters Drive to Marlatt along um, right near Eisenhower 
um, middle school. So we've been we've been talking about this for a while, and it would be partially done on school district property. So I think they need some easements as, as well. Um, but with the connection of the rec center as well as the uh, middle school, what what I've got is um, as long as you guys don't tell me I'm out of my mind, is I've got a letter of support from the school district that we do support that road going in um, on that project. So can I get kind of sort of thumbs up? or throw something at me if you don't want. But I, I think that connection piece is, will be excellent for us as far as getting our buses out to Marlat and a controlled signaled intersection to turn left onto Tuttle Creek Boulevard instead of an uncontrolled Walters Avenue. So I think it's uh, imperative for us to be supportive of the city in, in this endeavor. So that goes to the city commission. I believe they've got a partial design and they're asking for basically full design um, along that project. So I have a couple other things that I'll come up later and explain in the meeting, but um, for now, if you have any questions about those two, just let me know. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Another item for me is hopefully you had a chance to look, at least look through some of the district accomplishments. It, mm. it, it's nice to do this just because it brings back memories of things that, that occurred during, during the year, some of the, the recognitions, and I'm not gonna go through a lot, but just things like uh, two of the students getting perfect scores on the ACT, the passage of the bond, that was this year. A lot's gone on, but that was this year. You know, the chamber uh, expanded its program, the career exploration into eighth grade and had opportunities for those students. Uh, Leadership Manhattan had its first education session, meeting with our administrators, taking community leaders out in the schools, learning about them, uh, Committee for Diversity and Inclusion met on a regular basis, uh, JAG-K program was implemented this year, just on and on and on, lots of, lots of great things going on in our district, and even now going through, flipping through it, I, I remembered something that's not in here, that we had bus drivers that got recognition at a bus driver rodeo that I don't think we ever brought that to the board. There's just all of those kind of things that could go in here. And that's, I think that's running, what the risk we run by making a list of the things that have, have been accomplished. But uh, busy year, successful year for staff, students, programs throughout the district. And I do believe, unless we can get him back to visit sometime, this is, this is your last, Official board meeting, isn't it? <laughs> Look at that smile. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Hoyt, for, for everything you've done. And unless there's questions, that's it for me. Thank you. All right. NEA. Aaron, welcome. Erin Meyer Gambrell, NEA, Manhattan Ogden. All right, we'll go ahead and connect up. And while that is pulling up, I'm gonna go ahead and cover what our agenda is tonight. For my report, we have the past district events, upcoming district events. Then I have a new segment tonight, which is, where's Aaron and Ashley? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to end with celebrating what's right. That'll reconvene in July on the July 17th board meeting. And here we go. All right. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> We are again. <laughs> All right. So past district events, I'd like to highlight our NEA Manhattan Ogden and USD 383 retirement dinner as I wasn't able to be at the meeting because I was washing dishes. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to thank uh, USD 383 for partnering with us as NEA Manhattan Ogden to co-host a retirement dinner this year. I'd also like to publicly thank our corporate sponsors, Olson, the Alms Group, and Texas Roadhouse. You might not be able to see it, but there is a table tent 
um, up there by the plant in the top corner with an image of each of our corporate sponsors. This event wouldn't have been feasible without them. And while they were not a corporate sponsor, I would also like to give a shout out as well to my former principal, Lori Martin, because the plates service, the tablecloths, the chargers, all that comes from Casa de Martin. So <laughs> it's a good thing that Lori likes a good party because she was my party planning central going over to her barn and pulling all of that out. Uh, last year when I was planning my wedding, she said, you know, I got it all in the barn. You can do service for 300. And I thought, nope, I'm not hauling that anywhere. <laughs> 300 so you know goals you know one day we're gonna be big enough that you know hopefully we're not retiring 300 people at a time and then we have just kind of some of that set up uh, Ashley and I had a wonderful time going and shopping for the plants at Menards big thank you to the alms group for purchasing all of those and then while you can't necessarily see it very well we have in the bottom right hand corner the desserts and those were created by the family and consumer science students there were two different ones we had the chocolate mousse and then the lemon curd I think with raspberry both of them were phenomenal it was a real pleasure for me doing the dishes before the event and then also after because beforehand the students were in there making the desserts so I was able to personally thank them for that contribution to us and um, then afterwards, you know, my husband got to enjoy the leftovers when they got home. <laughs> so, and just to thank you as well to um, the high school as well for agreeing to host and letting me rearrange the atrium. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about some upcoming events. Right now, ongoing, we have STEM at K-State. That'll actually be ending this week. I believe tomorrow is the last day. That is grades five through eight. We have KRR. That is, again, ongoing until the end of June. So I do believe this week is the last week for KRR. Negotiations is currently on pause. We are hoping to reconvene on July 11th at 4.30. District enrollment will be occurring at the end of July, so make sure that you're keeping an eye out for open enrollment. We have the new educator, Ice Cream Social, which will be on August 2nd at MHS East. I would like to also give a shout out tonight to Baskin Robbins, who is again donating the ice cream again for this event. And, um, Never fear, I am currently looking for sponsors for the new educator luncheon to put that on again. That'll be on August 5th at MHS West. So anyone in the audience who might be a business owner, please consider. All right, so next week you might be wondering, where's Erin and where's Ashley? Because no one will be here again for another report. So Ashley and I have the honor to be elected delegates for the National Education Association's Representative Assembly. We will be going to Houston, Texas on Tuesday, July 2nd. We'll have a lovely 12-hour car drive road trip, and um, we'll be there until July 8th. We'll be roommates the whole time, so hopefully, you know, not only do we work together, but now we're gonna like really test our friendship until July 8th when we return. This National Delegate Assembly is bigger than the Republican and the Democratic National Convention. We have over 8,000 educator delegates who attend every single year annually to this event. The opening statement last year was from Mark Farr, who was our KNEA president to our local, we have our own presidential, and then we also have our local state representative assembly that gets together before we go on the main floor. And his opening statement to us as delegates was, without hope, kids can't dream. And what educators do is give hope to students in the future of education. The thing that really brings me hope this year is that for the first time in NEA Manhattan Ogden's history, we get two delegates instead of one. Our membership increased by over 8% in the last year. That's a really big deal, especially in a state that is not necessarily friendly to associations. 
as we just heard from Job Corps being here, unions make a difference. They make a difference with working conditions, wages, and again, helping, helping people have a hand up versus a hand out, making our profession a better place. So I'm very proud of us as an organization for the work that we've done here locally in Manhattan, but also bridging that gap too with the local community to again, get more and more people involved because again, public education isn't just the school district or just the teachers or just administrators or just parents and just businesses. We all have to come together to really make that change and we saw that this year with our bond issue. So, so those relationships really matter. So for us, two delegates is a really big deal. It's not necessarily as big as some of the others that are there, but I know it's a big deal for us. And on that, any questions for me? Thank you. <laughs> okay, Board of Education. I don't have anything. I just wanted to note the passing of Marvin Marsh. His son Mike is our athletic director. I didn't know Marvin. I'd met him, but I didn't know him. But as a longtime person in the community and board member, Marvin was a legend and it's clear he touched so many lives and I think there's a number of educators in our district who probably became educators because of Marvin um, so it's my loss that I never got to know him but our community and our school system obviously benefited greatly from Marvin's uh, service in our district and to the world at large so our thoughts and condolences to uh, Mike and his family and Marvin will be missed. And, and speaking of missing, I don't know what to say, Greg. I'm sort of sitting here lost for words. Um, all three of my daughters, you know, went through your buildings. Um, we've had a lot of great conversations. I think the one that will stick with me forever is standing out in the parking lot at Eisenhower one night and you're talking about how you needed a second gym. That was a long time ago. <laughs> That was a long time ago, but it's happening. And that's, so, you know, that's a lesson that I've learned in, in doing this, this job is this stuff doesn't happen fast, but if you just keep at it, keep at it, uh, it comes, it comes around. So sorry that you didn't get a gym when you were principal at Eisenhower. <laughs> I'm sorry that I didn't even get there while you were still in our system, but um, you were, you were an important piece of that happening for our, our students and uh, your contribution to our district is immeasurable. So I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Okay. Well, it's kind of hard to follow that. Thanks, Dave. So I'll just say ditto. Thank you, Greg. I have a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about the 2020 census, which might seem a long way away, but it's April 1st, 2020 is census day. And you may not know that the census is very important for us in public education because a lot of our funding and programs depends on an accurate census count. So there will be a lot of uh, activities in the communities and in education over the next several months leading up to the census 2020. So I just wanted us to be aware of that and involved in it. And I think, uh, you know, there's um, there's an effort to have each community have a, a complete count committee. And I, I imagine that the city commission is probably involved in that as well, because of course, accounts very uh, important for our city as well. So I hope we can, you know, get some representation on that complete count committee. And I'll just kind of keep you updated as things go on with, um, with uh, materials and uh, activities that KSB is putting on in regard to that. And then um, thanks Aaron for that mention of the uh, KNEA annual convention or the NEA annual convention because that reminded me that the National School Boards Association annual convention is in Chicago this coming February 2020. So 
it's easy for some of us to get there a lot easier. I went to my first annual convention this past winter in um, Philadelphia, and it was about 6,000 some school board members. It was fantastic. It was the program was great, and just being there with a bunch of people like us who are really committed to public education was fantastic. So uh, it's it's like the I can't remember what dates in February, but I can get that to you. But I just thought you all might want to know that since we have direct flights to Chicago from Manhattan, it's it's really convenient for us this year. So I'll keep you posted. Thanks. I have two things. Um, first, I I haven't talked about this before because we ha we've had a break and we haven't had a meeting since then. Um, Daryl and I were able to have our second Saturday coffee in June and we were really happy to we were fine to talk to each other but it was even better when people from the community actually came and we had an opportunity to visit with some folks we had um, a school employee that came to visit with us we had a parent who came to visit and we had a um, potential board member a board candidate come and visit and so as each of those people tr you know came in at their own time and joined the conversation it really coalesced into I think a nice productive conversation and I am grateful that um, Jardine suggested them way back when and that we've persevered with doing them even if nobody comes if nobody comes then two board members get a chance to visit about whatever and talk about the weather or what else is going on in our lives and get to know each other in different ways. And, um, but it's even better when people from the community come. So the next uh, second Saturday coffee would be the, had it in my head, July 13th at a location to be determined later. And I am signed up as is Leah. So um, we'll make sure that we get that information out there again and we'd love to have people from the community come out and chat with us. The second piece um, came up in my email today and I was happy to see that there is a Manhattan location happening for it. Some of you guys have probably seen um, that the Kansas Children's Cabinet is doing a statewide tour, uh, listening tour or conversation tour to speak with uh, folks in the community about early childhood education. And so they're wanting to um, connect with the, all of the stakeholders in early childhood education. So that's all of us, whether you have, an, have a young child right now or not. The bottom line is that's all of us. And they will be here in Manhattan on Tuesday, July 9th at 5.30, from 5.30 to 6.30 in the Family and Child Resource Center, um, which is at 2101 Claflin. So um, I'm gonna say it used to be a retirement center. <laughs> um, so if you, if you visually land, need to landmark places, that's where that office is now, where, the, where that location is. Um, there's other locations as well, but it was nice to see the Manhattan location happening. And again, that's Tuesday, July 9th from 5.30 to 6.30, and they want to hear from us. So if somebody's going to come out and ask to hear or want to listen to you, then let's take that opportunity to, to actually have those conversations. And that's all I had. Well, I can say ditto on uh, Dave's part with, uh, with Greg and everything, because it's been great having you up there. and. Uh, it was a great transition and did a great job up there. I just appreciate everything you've done. And, and now you've trained the next person, and we know you'll be not far away on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I know your future office. <laughs> but uh, thanks for everything you've done and, and the hard work that's gone in up there. It's not an easy task. Um, and to go along with that, uh, I want to put a plug in for all the uh, – Firework stands are going to be there out there to support our high school activities. I heard of one today uh, for band, and there's going to be several others out there. Uh, so if you're going to get your fireworks, please support some of our uh, extracurricular activities. Uh, they're going to be out there. And for those who uh, think that the students are just resting this summer, they are not. Uh, there's a group in Dallas right now. There's been a group in where was the BP? Florida, another one went to California. I mean, they are all over the place, it seems like, right now. So our students are running around, and they're learning a lot right now. 
Yeah, and that takes a lot of teachers to go with them as well. So just uh, think about that when you're thinking about uh, the, the summer activities and the, the fact you think the students and the teachers are, are having the summer off. They definitely are not. That's all. STEM Showcase is Friday, Friday. and Lacey's going to have to help me with the place and time. So STEM showcase Friday 9 to 11 at K-State's engineering building across from the Union. I went last year, it was amazing, and I'm excited to see what's presented this year. Thank you, Lacey, for your work on that. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I guess, again, I'll, I'll uh, echo what everyone has said about Greg, and, and I think one of the first time I met, ran for the school board in 2006, I went and met with every school principal and, and uh, I remember Greg's office was uh, cub heavy. Um, and, and he was a loyal fan and they only won like 60 games that year. And if you're a baseball fan, you know how terrible it is, but I'm glad you were able to see a world series, but I've always appreciated that. Uh, there's quite a few times I've called you and asked you for an honest opinion and, and you've always given it to me. So I, I thank you for your work. And, and also Lacey, thank you for, for your hard work here as well. And good luck to you. And, and uh, we're saying actually saying goodbye to quite a few administrators this year. Um, we have Greg and uh, Brett Nelson is going to uh, uh, Clay Center as a superintendent. Uh, Mindy Sanders will be going to her hometown uh, of Abilene as a, as a grade school principal. Uh, Lori Martin um, for through a retirement. Um, Andrea Titi was has will be well, I guess we'll say goodbye to her, but hello to a new position as our per, uh, director of uh, special ed, and then Deb Hauser who is also leaving for uh, I guess I would say a greener a better job, um, for lack of a better term. Um, Lacey going to uh, Gary County for as a associate assistant superintendent, something like okay. <laughs> And then, uh, and, but uh, the one reason I want to really mention this too is, you know, like I, I think every, we've lost some, some of our administrators to, uh, uh, to retirement, but most, almost every one of them we've lost to uh, promotions. Um, so I, I think that says a lot about our district and that, that uh, our employees are, are uh, uh, we're, a, we're an administrator factory and I think we send a lot of great teachers out of here also. And, um, but I think that speaks well for our district. And anyway, but thank you all for your, for your uh, time here. Good luck to you. Okay. Yes. I don't know if it got um, reported. I just thought about this for donations and grants. We did um, receive the, or it was recommended for us to receive the $190,000 grant from um, the special alcohol fund um, advisory board. Um, it, it still needs to go. It, it was at the work session. And it still needs to be approved, but we were, um, recommended to get that just so you guys are aware and that um, works or that funds completely the drug and alcohol program that we do okay great thank yeah. you mm -hmm. all right anyone else okay okay on to we have a Manhattan high school uh, annual report that's uh, anybody have any questions comments on that okay also have uh, our uh, um, public schools foundation report. Uh, Mr. Morrison is here. If anybody has any questions or comments, Oh, yeah, turn, yeah. Thank you. Anybody got any questions? Okay. I'm going to share some highlights with us. Well, with the financial, you can see that uh, um, our assets are somewhat stabilized. They grow slowly, but sitting at $3 million. Um, I didn't do a full calculation, but guessing of what we spent this last year. Um, of the funds we raised or earned was probably close to $200,000 between grants, scholarships, and projects for the school. Um, August is our annual meeting for the foundation, so we have three board members that are transitioning off. 
And so um, we'll have a new flavor a little bit uh, come August. Um, things that I assume you know that we think are important is that we have continued with our teacher staff awards in August. Um, they'll be the SHRAC awards, the master teacher, elementary, secondary, teacher of the year. And um, I think equally important is the uh, staff five personnel sections that are uh, also given cash awards. They're between $500 and $250. Um, in May of this past year, we gave our student scholarships. I'm looking again at the list. I, I've gotten myself uh, extricated from the uh, scholarship committee, but I think we had 25 scholarships or 30. Four of them are multiple year, uh, two of them are 2,000 a year for repeated years of four years. Um, I think that's a pretty significant gain. We're hoping, we're hoping we could add to that. Um, early expressions, I don't know if you hear about it in February, but we had about 35 to 40% of your students participate. Um, it about overwhelmed us. Your art teachers were, went crazy and their kids went, their, their kids went crazier and the optimists that helped sort it and do it and judge it went really crazy because we haven't handled 2,700 pictures in one morning in our lifetime. Wow. So it was phenomenal. We had a great show at the uh, Beach Museum. It makes it really special for children. Um, I always get tickled. Uh, Ralph Fontenot, when we got it going, he's, he was kind of lamenting one day that it didn't seem fair. He'd been an art professional and teacher for years, and he had never had an art piece hung in the Beach Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, he's had two, so I feel, oh, I feel better. Um, this is our second year we've completed the Teacher, Staff, and Student Recognition Award. Um, Greg would know. Um, this is where uh, we have independent funds that were given specifically for this program. It, it recognizes teachers, staff, and students who are nominated by other teacher, staff, parents, whomever. Um, for these awards, uh, the teachers are $500, staff $250, and the kids that are nominated get $50 cash, which is kind of anonymous. We always call on Greg's uh, courtesy of calling the kids to the office. It may scare some of them because some of them probably. Scares about all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that their <laughs> he presents them with the. the statement of nomination, which I think for many of these kids is kind of a positive thing um, because it's not meant, it's not exclude A students, but it's not meant to be identifying your exceptional academic students either. Um, and he gets to give them the money for whatever purpose they want. Um, the process was expanded this last year to include the middle schools only for teachers and staff. Uh, we didn't feel like at that point we wanted to include students and um, just harder to identify. You had sixth grade, I think it even adds a different element to what we would be able to do. Um, it looks like we have another year going with both the uh, middle school and high school teacher and staff and high school kids for another year. Um, we had a surprise about two years ago, anonymous letter showed up saying, Proud, uh, pleased to tell you you've been awarded $50,000 from this woman's estate for music in this last year. We've engaged that uh, with Eric's help um, and through this music department to do some improvements for them. Um, the lady loved music, never lived in Manhattan that I know of, had no connection that I'm aware of, except her niece by marriage is from Manhattan. So I, I, I don't know how that happened. Um, we do sponsor each year for the last eight or 10 years. Uh, maybe Kathy could tell us, but the major saver for elementary school funding for projects that they want. Um, I don't know this last year in the low $30,000 for our grade schools to have. Um, and that's money that goes to schools that spend as they deem appropriate within guidelines for the district. Um, we have at this point four teacher scholarships that are for teachers who are wanting to enhance their classroom skills. We don't want them to care about being better administrators. We don't care about better coaches. We want better teachers in class. And so they get money to do whatever they want, whether it's additional academic studies or 
um, programs that they can attend. Um, some really interesting programs out there that some of your teachers have attended. <laughs> a couple of really wild ones in math, and they sounded fun. So uh, maybe it's doing some good. Um, of course, we worked on funding for the Rezac Auditorium. We have some money left as the process go. We can spend, I don't know, we still have about 30,000 left, I think, on improvements for Rezac. We spent about 70 in addition to money that you spent. Um, one of the continuing big funds, other than the scholarship ones, is the Kermser Fund, for which this room's named for the Kermser family. And in the most recent years, they've been using it uh, for the summer library special programs, the funding from that. And then, of course, I think anything at summertime would be a, a failure to mention that uh, we have been an active participant and encourager and money handler for the Flint Hill summer camp for start out primarily with the pairing of autistic children and others and it keeps growing and so we're really just a conduit but try to help also raise funds for them. So those are some of the things we're doing and uh, um, you can look at the financial I gave you and see the various accounts and what some of them you can tell what they're for some of them may be a little cryptic but uh, they're almost all scholarship or special program funds we have maybe $60,000 of discretionary money that we latch on to. So, any questions? So when you say that all, everything is for a, or most of those things are for a scholarship and you only have 60,000 of discretionary funds. So does that mean that, um, that the folks who are I don't know, in charge of that fund, or is it the trust company that says exactly where that no. those funds go? The, the foundation board decides all of that. For example, the Brandon Fund has a little over half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And so from that fund is where we pay the Brandon scholarships from. But it's to go to a scholarship specifically. Yes. Okay, not that's all of them. Some of those are for other projects and other programs, but uh, that one happens to be scholarship. Some of them you can tell by uh, their name, um, scholarships, or others. Mm -hmm. yeah. The second tier down there, um, which has early expressions and all those are holding funds for activities for projects, mm -hmm. the Rezac fund, the, the early expressions, things like that. Now, the early expressions, we give money each year to the elementary and secondary art teachers for programming. Okay. And other ones, not a question, but a comment, and that I was able to participate on the strategic planning last year, so I appreciate um, the support on strategic planning. I think that that's been very important for our board and our school district to go through that so that we have a, a, a plan on how we're getting where we want to go. So, okay. Well, was that, was the, that was the request and the alleged purpose, and so you folks get to determine the outcome of the purpose. but. Uh, um, that was in fact available. My also the final thing I'd mentioned is uh, in August, October, uh, we will have been in business 30 years. So it's taken 30 years to go from zero to three million bucks. So um, we're pleased, but um, we can always use more donations well, and gifts. It, I guess, I, and I, I'd never seen it, and maybe I should know this, but I mean, if someone wants to apply, do they apply for a, a scholarship like for the Roger Brennan? Scholarship. Right. I mean, there are there guidelines somewhere where you can go online so and counseling uh, offices. They're all through the counseling office. Okay, I still okay. Have them on the website. Oh, good. Okay. And we have a uniform application for all the scholarships that are offered, and it will tell you what the requirements are. I knew you were on top of that, but I just wanted <laughs> wanted to the public to hear that too. So, okay, okay. thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you. Here we have a warehouse annual report. And uh, the, all three, the alternative high school graduate list, the high school graduate list, and the virtual academy graduate list. Any questions, comments? No. Okay. Moving on to new business. Uh, first item on there, we have uh, the uh, Eugene Field Classroom Furniture. Carla? I move to give final approval to accept the bid for Lakeshore Learning for $21,501.34 for the purchase of classroom furniture and supplies for Eugene Field Early Learning Center. Seconded by Leah. Anything from the audience? All those in favor? 
Motion is unanimous. All right, well, you're pretty fat. You're too fast on the draw there. I'm not quite. I <laughs> know. Good job. I need to get caught up here. Okay. Next item we have is the middle school library furniture replacement. Mr. Leah? President, I have a motion. I move to give final approval for the purchase of new black, new library casework from Mid States School Equipment of Lee Summit, Missouri in the amount of $61,410 and new library furniture from Kruger International of Green Bay, Wisconsin in the amount of $22,241. Seconded by Jardine. Anything from the audience? All those in favor? 7-0. Next we have the asphalt parking lot repairs for Katrina. Mr. President, yes. I have a motion. I move to give final approval to the bid submitted by Schilling Construction of Manhattan, Kansas for the USD 3D3 asphalt parking lot repairs at Eisenhower Middle School and Manhattan High West Campus in the amount of $99,095. Seconded by Carla. Audience, all those in favor? 7-0. All right, next we have the City of Manhattan cost share agreement. That's uh, what Eric... I thought I did that one. That was asphalt. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. They're totally different. Yeah, there is. It's a construction material straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, Katrina. I move to give, Mr. President, I move to give final approval to the oh, bid yeah. submitted by Economy Carpentry and Concrete of Manhattan, Kansas, for the USD 3D3 concrete parking lot repairs at Marlatt Elementary School in the amount of ten thousand seven fifty. Seconded by Carla. Audience. All those in favor, seven zero. Now the city of Manhattan cost share agreement. All right, what I'm bringing forward to you guys tonight is um, we, well, we've kind of talked about this all along where when we went into the agreement with the city for the rec center project, they were well ahead of us. They secured their funding a, a year in advance, the November before ours did, so their planning was able to start. If you guys remember the the original plans that we saw for the rec center projects had the buildings in totally different places than the way they do now. And the same thing happened with USD 383 on our additions as well. And what we always held on to is what well, we have a plan, but the plan might need to change because it has to work for both entities. So when we decided to really put the wing where we intended to put it, which that wasn't a secret. I think our, our addition always went in a similar area, but the opportunity to include the storm shelter in the same area and make that a piece of the connection, um, that basically one of the push behind that was to give us two entries into the storm shelter. So you're not trying to bring 700 people down one hall into a set of double doors to get into a storm shelter. Sometimes you don't have that much time. So having two entries and two multiple ways to get in that, um, as well as being large enough for band and orchestra and being able to do that, we, we felt like that was the place to put it in the building. That's what works best for the district. That's what works best for our students and staff, and we can give the best opportunity. We also thought it might give a good opportunity for the rec center in case there was a storm on a weekend or an evening when the rec center was in a session and we were not in session. There's no reason we should have a storm shelter 20 feet away from those people and not allow them to enter into our storm shelter in that mind. Um, so we, we've thought about that a long ways. But what that did was because the city was ahead of us and where we were planning, push their buildings out um, to a different location, change the angle a little bit which um, at both Anthony and Eisenhower will create some issues as far as the dirt we need to fill in. Now, I think, I believe I told you long ago that I would probably be coming back to you guys with things and problems we had along the way. There are problems when our projects shift their projects and what they're planning meets what, we're, what we need to do as well. Um, where we've talked about city administration and our administration have talked about coming up to reasonable solutions that we can all help each other in that. And us shifting the buildings did cause a significant increase to them. We don't know exactly what that is. Um, worst case scenario, what McCown Gordon quoted to both of us was um, $500,000 would be the worst of making that shift. And we 
felt like administration on both entities felt like a share of that would be the best course of action for both of us moving forward if, if we shared that expense. That allows us to keep the gyms the way we want them to be, um, our side of the gym, so things aren't cut out of that. Um, we, there, there's always an opportunity to cut out of projects, but we want the both projects to be the max they possibly can, and we believe that working together is the way to do that. So. I might have more of these in the future. Um, just just to let you guys know, we're we're looking into probably some site drainage issues. Uh, this dirt predominantly the cost is at Anthony because um, you you guys know the site at Anthony is much more up and down. Eisenhower is flat as a pancake. That'll be the problem at Eisenhower is it's too flat. The problem at Anthony too far up and down with where we want to go. So we might be looking at some other joint solutions because if we don't look at the outside and the groundwork as a group, it's almost impossible to address it. It'll be very difficult for us to take care of our end and the, and the city to take care of their end if we're not working together on that. So um, this is the first agreement we're coming to you guys with of something along these lines. We will try and keep them to the very bare minimum that we can and try to be as reasonable as we possibly can going forward. But we want to help both projects go and, and do that. So that's why we're bringing the shared agreement to you guys tonight. Daryl? If I remember right, has the city already... Has the city already approved their portion of this? Yes, sir. So I thought. Katrina. You mentioned that there might be some other uh, agreements that we'll have to make, such as the drainage, other areas that, you're, that you foresee, and are they all related to this the gym project? Well, it's the only, the gym project is the only project we're in joint with. Okay. So yeah, I mean, every, all of our other projects are our projects and they're, we're not sharing too much and, and they're not connected. We, we always knew these, these projects on these two campuses, if we did it right, they're going to blend and they're going to connect and they're going to be there. But our other ones, we don't, I think we took, uh, they brought up maybe some fire hydrant services that, um, We'll, we'll have to kind of work out to make sure we have uh, fire response access, which the city is the one that are going to make us make sure we have our hydrants in the right spot so we can do that. And that includes their building as well. So um, those, those are two just off the top of my head we'll have to work at, but our, our teams have been great um, to work with. I really appreciate the people at the city and our, and our construction teams too have been wonderful. So some of the city commissioners seemed surprised by this at, when you presented to them. So was that always an understanding that has, how has that, how has that understanding of agreement been communicated from the get go that we would have to work together on projects? I only have my opinion on that. I, I believe it's been communicated the same way um, to the city commission as it's been to you guys that our, our best course of action is together on, on this. And, um, if you get into the nickels and dimes and, you know, the, this is your scoop of dirt and this is my scoop of dirt, I think you're going to do nothing but damage the projects all the way through. So I, I think that's been the core of where we've been coming from all along. And then we, I say, our administration and city administration. D Daryl, do you have a question? No. Okay. So I make a motion. Mr. President, I move to get final. Microphone. Oh. <laughs> One of these days, I move to give final approval for granting approval to enter into the cost share agreement with the city of Manhattan as presented. Seconded by Leah. Anything from the audience? All those in favor? Seven zero. Personalized learning. And Dr. Wade, you are on this one. Man. Oh, it's in the. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, okay. That's important. I can't believe you missed Amanda Arnold. So I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little You're off tonight. Trouble. The concrete the asphalt thing really threw me <laughs> off. <laughs> well, I think that's in our. Is that on our e yes. EBN? Yep. Yeah. That's why I missed it. EBN, yeah. It's in the EBN page six. 
I'm here to answer any questions, talk to you since it is our first official bid, first official project for the bond. Um, Kathy's here too, because we did add some alternates to this um, project. We are going to use some capital outlay dollars as well, because um, we used as much as the bond money as we had, but we also used some of hers, because she asked for some additional things um, beside the parking lot. Um, and the drainage. So we're going to do some ADA parking um, on the south side, a new ADA entry into the multipurpose room. Um, the ramp that is currently there was from the last bond and it was just a temporary to get things in and out of the building. So it's really not supposed to be there. <laughs> so it will be gone. <laughs> um, we're going to add some lights to the north parking lot because it is so dark in that north parking lot. Um, and we are also going to add some more lighting to the existing parking lot, um, both on the east side and the south side, and replace, replace the existing lighting, but we also add some more uh, lighting to the parking as well. So, um, and we're going to put a trash enclosure around the um, dumpster and the recycling bin because one day we were out there and there was just trash everywhere. So it's not a good, good site. So, um, so there's things that we're doing, but we are um, going to use majority of the pretty much all of the bond money that was associated to the project but we are going to use her capital outlay dollars as well okay. like Carla? to make a motion yes okay i move to give final approval to the gmp from bhs construction hutton in the amount of two hundred twenty six thousand three hundred sixty six dollars and accepting all art all alternates listed Seconded by Jardine, she beat you. <laughs> Anything from the audience? All those in favor? Seven zero. Great, thank you very much. Okay. All right, now we're to the personalized personalized learning. Dr. Wade. This is a good opportunity for me to say goodbye to Lacey in some ways because uh, one of our first conversations we had when we both came into the district was about, you know, what do we want to accomplish with teaching and learning? Where do we want to go? What do we have in place? Where can we go? And uh, we had conversations about things like common unit design, the idea of having uh, fidelity across. There's that's kind of a bad word now, fidelity. We moved into reducing variance, but having, you know, <laughs> we're going to reduce variance about what's taught, when and where, and how in the district so that we have a baseline that we can build on, that we've got to know what we're doing and that it's rigorous and relevant before we try some innovative things. And we looked at that, the idea of common units, the instructional core, how really the the root of the things that we're doing is having challenging curriculum, having knowledgeable and dedicated staff and engaged students all working together. And that's where the magic occurs. And how do we provide support for that? And looking at just the idea that we can build on what we've got here toward the idea of what we're going to do with to do with the personalized learning. And staff, as I mentioned in the report, staff have said that's an area they want to go into, building on what we've done with multi-tiered system of supports. And the idea with the personalized learning would be, uh, one of the things we did, I'm kind of jumping around, but one of the things we did in our training session May 30th was talk about personalized learning can start out small and be different places and different buildings doing different things. But the idea is that we, we know our students, we know their interests, we know their needs, we know their strengths, we know their weaknesses. We work with them so that they understand those and that we can build plans for helping them achieve what we know they need to know, but also to try to make it relevant to them. And in that work that we did on the 30th with the Institute for Personalized Learning, which is what I'm, I'm recommending here, was we did work at the building level with uh, where do buildings want to start at? And about half of our buildings want to work with learner profiles. Uh, kind of an expansion of the individual plan of study, the teacher, the student-led conferences, you know, not everybody likes those things, but, the, but we put them into place that we believe that that promotes ownership from the students, 
they have to under, they have to better understand what they're learning and why and be able to explain it. Uh, so about half of our buildings said they want to build on that learner profile. The other half wants to work on proficiency-based progress that it's, there's different ways for students to show they know what they know and that they know how to use it. So let's allow some latitude in how they do that and being able to, and it does, and, and one of the reasons we I, I mentioned with, with Lacey and the common unit design is we have to keep the bar high in our district for our students to leave and continue those accomplishments that we were talking about earlier. We have to keep the bar high, but there's different ways to achieve the mastery of the content and to demonstrate that. And that's what we want to do with the personalized learning is to be able to, to break down some of those um, constraints that we have in our system. And we looked at, at, you know, we had to talk about what is personalized learning. There was something in our, in our um, KISA report the outside visitation team report about how the districts talked about we want to do personalized learning but what is personalized learning what is personalized learning what is it not and what does it mean for our district and I, I'll even read read this it's in the report about that you know it's it's learning and instruction revolving around individual learner readiness strengths needs and interests it's like a gradual release of instead of the teacher doing the work and the students being the recipient, you gradually move toward where the students are taking more responsibility for the learning and the teachers are the facilitator of that learning. So that's the kind of work that we're, we're getting started in with this personalized learning. Um, it's a little bit vague intentionally because it's gonna take a different, a, a different look in different classrooms, in different buildings, depending on the comfort level of the staff. But I feel good about the, you know, in late starting going back to, you know, Lacey's not going to be here anymore, but we're still going to be in contact because, you know, she's, she's worked a lot with this. And I know uh, the Council for Public School Improvement, one of the sessions we've got next year is going to be the same person from personalized learning who came and worked with us May 30th. So there's going to be opportunities for us to do some of this in, as a region. I'm kind of jumping around with it, but it, it's really the idea of taking what we've already built in the district and um, expanding the opportunities for students to demonstrate what, what they've learned and how they can use it and to, to give that permission to the staff as well. Daryl? Daryl? On the uh, seventeen thousand six forty-five, is that a just a one-time payment? Or are we going to be doing this as I guess subscription we'll pay, yearly? We'll we'll pay them as as the trainings occur. The actual uh, membership is in there. Let me see what that, I think that was a seventeen fifty. Yeah, that 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 would be the annual membership to be in the the institute. And then the other expenses are for the actual training that we'll be receiving this year. And then will there be additional training year after year, or will it just be this one year? Or? We'll see where, what we need with it, that it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily an ongoing. Just the 1750 is the ongoing? The, just the 1750 in order to be a membership. And what, you know, another example of what, what we can get with a personalized learning would be uh, some schools that do, and, and this is, it's, it's an evolution because there's building blocks to implementing personalized learning, just like with the MTSS, that we have to start where people are comfortable. There's going to be those early adopters who's run with it, who then others want to follow and be involved. There's going to be certain buildings that are going to be more interested in doing it and and they'll take off, but there's going to be an expectation throughout the district to do it. And the kind of things that I've seen with the Personalized Learning Institute for Personalized Learning is going into a school and having a student, a, an elementary student, carrying her her iPad and asking her in the hall. And this this is a real one because I did this. Asking her in the hallway, "What are you doing? Where are you going? 
well, I need to complete this assignment that I was working on, that one of my social emotional aspects I'm working on for myself is that my friends said I need to be less defensive when they're trying to help me. So I'm keeping track of those things and I'm going to report to the counselor how I've done this week on that. Or just those kind of things that the students are taking. We know, we know what we're doing, why we're doing it instructionally. The staff know that. The students, when the staff shares that with them as we do their individual profiles and their plans, they get a better understanding of what they're learning and they take more ownership and follow it themselves. An example at a secondary level, and this again is a, a place that evolved, was that they had traditional classes, they had wings for, for what they called their um, legacy school, which is a more traditional, but then they also had the program where the students have their own plans and the teacher is more of, as, that their schedule is open and they schedule meetings with students, with individual students, with groups of students, grouping them based on where they're at with what they're doing on their projects. So it's project management of the students doing their work and they have an understanding of what they have to do in order to, in order to receive credit in a class. And where I've seen this before is, in, is more uh, where we started out was the idea of competency-based that is opposed to seat time and you sit there and if you, you, you have to put in your time to get the credit regardless. But if you can come in at the beginning of the semester, and let's say this is gonna be a simplistic example, but if we have a semester exam that shows you know everything for that course and you can take it the day before that course starts, why are we going to expect you to spend time in that class? Why don't we have you move on to something else instead? Or another version of it would be uh, the student who is involved in varsity athletics. That can't they get a PE credit for being in a varsity sport? Or if they're in the choir at their church or they're in community choir and they can demonstrate the same skills that they have to demonstrate in the music classroom, why can't they earn credits for that and use their time in other ways? So that, that's kind of the, the big picture. You're, I hope that's getting to what you were looking at, Daryl. I was just asking about mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So it depends on how far we want to go into that. Do we want to be paying somebody to tell us how to do all those things? I don't think we need to. Um, I was just going to um, just echo some of the things that you actually expounded on. But um, I have seen a lot of personalized learning through Leadership for Tomorrow um, just across the state. And um, it's really exciting to hear that we're implementing that in our own way. Um, and I, I think that it is, it is such an exciting thing to see students um, driving their own education um, in a way that I think about I could have done so much more um, with my public school education had I had the reins, the way that these kids are going to be able to have the reins um, as we have classrooms that, that move more towards uh, personalized learning. So I'm really excited to see that. I am also super devastated that Lacey won't be here um, <laughs> because I know that she's been a champion for this. and. Um, and so I hope that whoever um, steps into this role is, is just as much of a champion for this for us as a district, um, because we need to be moving in that direction. Um, because I think that if we're not moving in this direction, um, people are going to go to schools where their kids have more choices and more options about how they learn. Um, and so we need to do this. And I'm, I'm very supportive of this move. So thank you. And an another point I want to make is the conversations we've had up to this point, because it's been a while since staff said they wanted to move into pers personalized learning, is again that aspect of, of the rigor and making sure that it's not a free-for-all. This isn't a anybody does anything and we're going to give you easy credits and move you through. We're going to increase our graduation rate and all those kind of things. That's not the intent here. It's to it's to provide some other ways for students to be able to do, to, to accomplish the, the big goal we've got, which is student success, academically, social, emotional, post-secondary preparation. All of those can be done through personalized learning. Carla. Um, 
are we, when you're talking about it, are you referring, is it mostly focused at that middle school, high school level, or are we talking about that this is something that's being implemented from the earliest stages? Early, earliest. Stages. So all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, and I share Jardine's excitement for it. I think that this is a great direction. I also, though, would encourage us to, I know we've got great people and we've got people who are going to be early adopters and then I, I get that there's an element of train the trainer or that we want to utilize mm -hmm. the skills of people that are doing it within our district. But I also think that it is a wise investment to continue bringing in some of those outside people because of changeovers with administrators, because you might have somebody who is not an early adopter who struggles with it, but then would really benefit two, three years in from hearing from that original presenter or from that original training again, once they've been able to be exposed to it and have the buy-in there that maybe they didn't have at the beginning. That I think bringing that cycle back around um, and bringing the, the, the original trainers or bringing it back to that rather than solely relying upon the the internal talent that we have and the people that do it. But I think it's a good investment to to really bring it back around that way. So that would just be some feedback that I have. And I'm glad you said that because one of the reasons that Institute for Personalized Learning is who we want to work with is looking at diff the work we've done up to now has been like pre-work pre of who to work with. And they have a toolbox with different different tools that we can use for different places at different times that, that allows us to be more really more personalized in what we do with the staff and helping to prepare them. So their role is going to be coaching us, facilitating, answering our questions along the way. And and part of the 17,000 this year is when we have our monthly leadership team meetings. In the past, we've had um, TASN come in with MTSS. We're going to have the people from Institute for Personalized Learning are going to join us remote for an hour during those monthly meetings with administrators and just touch base with us on where are we at with the progress we're making so that between their actual face-to-face -face sessions with staff, we have that monthly update on where are we at with the process. And, and really this, like I said, this year has been pre-planning. Next school year starting what is next Monday, July 1st? <laughs> yes, whoops, starting next next year is planning, structuring, working with the buildings, working with the district for oversight, for implementation, really more the following year. So it's going to be a, a slow rollout building on this, having the discussions along the way, because it's it's a scary, personalized learning is, a, is kind of a scary thing that's been done wrong a lot of places. And it's not just getting online software and setting them and kids in front of that. that. What we want is that the use of technology, the relationships built between the staff and the students and the parents, that we have flexibility in the content and the assessment and how they demonstrate the mastery, all of that together. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some work. Dave. A couple quick things. Um, are there other districts in the state, peer districts, that are using this this service? Not this this company. No, the there's there's a couple different districts doing personalized learning, but not with the institute. Okay, and just again in this reflection phase, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I remember when I first got on the board and I started learning about special education and. Um, IEPs and so one of my first questions as a board member is why doesn't every kid have an IEP and um, got got taught the complexities and the challenges and but but here we are moving in to a certain extent moving to that direction um, and uh, it just takes it takes a lot of time and a lot of planning and as, as you've said it done wrong it's <laughs> probably very problematic mm -hmm. so just have to be sure we're doing it doing it right so and I, I was looking to see don't have enough principals in the audience to kind of pull them in but we've we had we've had the conversations uh had the meeting um may 30th and feedback was that 
this is a good direction for us to go, that this firm understands what it's going to take, that, that Brenda, the indiv- I can't remember, um, Vogues, who did the, the training for us, has been through the entire process of implementing personalized learning, first as a principal when they first started as a, at her building, and then as a director of secondary education in another district that started from scratch with it. And it does, it does take time, but just like with the MTSS, we'll just build, build on it and make sure that what we're doing is succeeding along the way. Well, Leap of faith in some ways to be truthful. Yeah. And so I'll throw in one other little thing that, you know, talking about the, the schools that are interested in having their students lead their, you know, their parent teacher conferences mm-hmm. and take that ownership. Um, my oldest daughter, Allison, when she went into first grade, Cindy Garwick was her first grade teacher and Cindy Garwick was board certified. And one of the things that Cindy was really big on was, um, student led parent teacher conferences. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking my little first grader, how is she going to do that? But she sat there and did that. And I watched my daughter as a professional today and I can see the elements that, Cindy Garwick taught my daughter in first grade about how to present what you're working on and what your goals are and where you want to go and how you're going to get there. You know, those seeds were planted way back, way back when in the mid nineties. Um, so that's, that's a pathway that I'm a, I'm a big fan of. I've seen, seen the impact that can have and, and how it empowers students. So. And I, I think our staff's to be commended for, having an interest in this because when we had the had conversations early about with Kisa, you have choices about what areas do do you want it? What two areas are you going to pick as a district to focus on? Would have been a whole lot easier for us to say um, parent climate or something like that than to say personalized learning and academic engagement are two things that we want to take on. It's like, oh man. <laughs> I wanted to make a motion if there were no other comments. Um, I move to give final approval to payments to the Institute for Personalized Learning of $17,355 for membership and training expenses. <clears throat> Seconded by Leah. Anything from the audience? All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. All right. You're in budget transfers, I believe. Lou was on that, page nine. Everybody still doing okay? Yep. Doing your break, okay. Yeah, page nine in additional meeting items or 120 if you <laughs> added it to the stack. Um, background material, just, just to the funds and, and the transfers that are allowed <laughs> by state statute. And uh, then in the cons- current consideration, I just wanted to point out there were some changes that came about in as a result of Senate Bill 423, which is the main finance legislation that was passed a year ago, um, to where the past special ed and virtual ed funds came into the general fund and, ha- and had to be transferred out. That, and that hasn't changed. The change that came about was with at-risk and bilingual, there has to be a proportionate amount from the supplemental general fund as to the total that has to be transferred to those two funds and so the numbers may not always match exactly what we have in the budget document because of some of the things that change and even the special ed and virtual because your legal max figures that you finally get in first week of June don't match necessarily what you published in August at case in point this year we were I'm not talking a little bit off the top of my head right now but we were like 765,000 for virtual but the actual was eight hundred and almost eight hundred and fourteen thousand. So the numbers changed based on your audited value. So some of those don't, don't always match up, and there's some reasons for that that's built into the formula and some additions. And so I put some language there to kind of explain that. Uh, I also put some of the audit totals in there. You can see that we were supposed to, uh, for at risk, for example, we were we by the requirements of the finance form formula in the finance law, we had to put $4,402,822 towards at risk, and we put $4,487,000 in change. And you can see that kind of pattern continues 
all the way through the special ed at 7.868. That's the aid money that comes through the general fund that has to go there, but we, we spent almost $11 million in transfers. So again, we're supplementing that a little over $3 million out of regular monies and those type of things. So you can see the pattern of that uh, vocational at the bottom. There's a big, big number there uh, where we're almost a million dollars above what what is generated by the formula. So uh, we do supplement a lot of those programs and uh, subsidize them, if you will, with some of our state aid monies. Having said all that, uh, go on to the next page then. Um, as of today, or yesterday first, you see kind of the projected unencumbered balances for the funds that we're, we're uh, anticipating or recommending that we're going to use in year-end transfers to for special ed professional development and so on. And as of today then, in the general fund, uh, we're projecting an unencumbered cash balance of a little over 1900000 and recommending transfers to special ed, capital outlay, and contingency reserve. Special ed, 350000 capital outlay, 550000 and contingency reserve of 950000 for a total of 1850000 at this point from general fund. That, that leaves a balance of about 83000 or, or no, 63000 and change. That gives us some, author some room to try and finalize things as we close down the books and so on. We'll bring the actual final numbers to you once we, once we get them uh, closed down and, and any remainder of um, budget authority left in general fund would go to capital outlay. For the supplemental general, uh, projected any balance as of today of 982,108, recommending transfers to special ed of 650,000, professional development of 100,000, that will help with that profession, that, in that personalized learning piece you were just talking about, and textbook rental of 200,000 for a total of 950,000, and any remaining budget authority uh, that's in special ed once we close, or in supplemental general once we close down would go to special education. And again, the final numbers will come back to either the third or maybe not till the 17th, but we'll bring back the final numbers as part of our budget discussions moving forward. Be happy to entertain any questions. Daryl? Like to make a motion. Okay. I recommend, uh, or I move to give final approval to the recommendation that the Board of Education authorize the 2018 19 year end transfers of the balance of the remaining budget authority for 2018 19 to the special education capital outlay contingency reserve and or textbook rental funds. Additionally, remaining budget authority from the general and supplemental general funds will be transferred to the capital outlay and special education funds, respectfully. Final year end transfer values are to be reported to the board at a subsequent meeting. Second by Leah. Anything from the audience? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Lou. All right. The last of our regular items, or uh, not regular items, of our uh, old business is the uh, school board elections and interest in board officer positions. Um, we started this conversation at our last meeting, and, and it was so clear as mud to us then that uh, came up at the KSB Board of Directors' son to Kearney, Nebraska, who accepted a, uh, a position at an engineering consulting firm. So, yippee, uh, right out of K-State and right into the job job uh, stream, I guess, and off of my payroll. Um, <laughs> I'm not not that happy about it, right? Um, and so basically, they they kind of sent out a uh, uh, the legal staff put together some options and uh, kind of some suggested motions. Um, and I guess I mean I'll, I'll just go ahead and say that I mean I, I'm in favor of option one um, under um, of extending our president vice president to uh, um, January and then changing the board officers at that point. And I, I, I guess by saying that, I guess I'm, I'm throwing in my hat. I guess I would love to stay on as board president another six months. Anyone else? Daryl? Can we just say so moved? Well, we have we have to do it at our next meeting. Okay. Yeah. We can come to a consensus. We can. Okay. Well, do we want to? Anyone else have a comment or? All right, you want to thumbs up, thumb down. Carla remain as I have to say, Carla would remain as the vice president, also. So anybody, 
I didn't know we voted with a thumbs up and a thumbs down, but. Well, right, we're doing a consensus. We're not doing a motion with the vote. Sounds logical. Everybody okay with? Okay, well then I guess, so then you're saying we don't think we need to have a motion and a well, vote next week? We still, next next, next we'll week. Have a resolution. Have a resolution. Right, okay, right, yeah. And, but, then in, but in January, yeah. we still have to, and then in January, and then it would be from that point every January we would say we're going to change our board officers in the following January, not in July. Well, you'll just automatically change them in July. You right. don't have to say or January. Yeah. January. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Still clear as mud, right, guys? Right. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So uh, then, I guess our last option, our last thing on our agenda would be well is. Uh, Lou will be doing the uh, beginning of the budget discussion or budget planning, and that's in the EBN also. Uh, yes, page, it would just follow the, the page uh, 11. year in transfers document. Everybody still doing all right? Okay. Yep. Okay, this is kind of our second look at, at some of the preliminary information and so on. And still, of course, I'm going to have my disclaimer down here at the bottom that uh, their projected values. They'll change when they go into the software. The software is projected to come out the July 8th. And, you know, the variability is due to technical portions of the formula that shift from year to year. There's one, one the LOB is driven a lot by the average valuation per pupil and where you fall in the rank order of that. There's uh, some other things in transportation that's student density within your district. So there's, and those things change from year to year at risk formula you know so those things are, are the variability things that until we get the formula and know what those those numbers are and and then those are you know pre-plugged if you will in the budget software uh you can you can project but you can't can't land them so to speak okay just the calendar um we just did the year-end transfers and we'll come back on the third and do our organizational meeting uh, see if we have any any new information or report as far as budget development and those kind of things. Uh, we'll be going to Eric and I'll be going to budget workshop on July 8th at Shawnee Heights. Um, as Dale and Craig are beginning their tour late, uh, short right, shortly after the Fourth of July weekend, I think they they start up and they start in the western part of the state and work their way east and and uh, the one at Shawnee Heights, I believe, is the no, the one at Salina is after that on the 10th is, I think, the last one. Uh, the 17th, we'll come back and do budget planning and development update. There's a potential that we might have the budget ready by that point. Potentially. We'll see. Your wife's so, working overtime this year? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. yes. We'll, we'll be working overtime. <laughs> People keep asking us for what the plans July 4th, and I said, all my answer is it's budget season. <laughs> Taking a vacation, it's budget season. <laughs> And, and that's just the way it is. That's just the cycle. Um, we'll have the budget review session with KSDE. They haven't opened up uh, to schedule appointments for that, but some, at some point we get it ready, I'll, we'll get scheduled and take it to, to a visit with Craig and Dale about uh, just looking it over and make sure we've done everything properly. If we're on a normal timeline, if we don't move up, we will be uh, authorizing the budget publication and scheduling the public hearing on August 7th, which is by just the way the calendar falls, that's the latest we can be, or the, just to try and do it, just, and that's just the way the calendar falls. Uh, we'd publish the budget in the newspaper on Friday the 9th, and then have our hearing and adoption of the budget at the next board meeting on August 21st. Like I said, if we can get things done and so on, we might be able to move up to the 17th and the 7th. I, can't promise that at this point, but I, I think there's the potential that could happen if everything falls in place and, and our work goes well and, and other things come along. But that would be the normal schedule. But I'm very happy that the software is coming out two, three weeks earlier and it's not going to have to be, you know, a sprint at this point. We can do it and do it right. And then, of course, we'll submit the, uh, the budget to the Riley County Clerk and KSD. It has to be done statutorily by August 25th, which falls on a Sunday. So Friday the 23rd will be the deadline for those submissions. Okay, new information. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, our assessed valuation data. Uh, had to make a couple of calls to a couple of county clerks to get these. And, 
and so on and but got that uh, and basically the uh, we're when you combine them all together we're at about a 2.18 percent projected increase which is down a little bit from from what we've been in a few prior years uh, last year we were around three percent before that we had been closer to five percent but still it's a positive number it's a lot better than a lot of places have been uh, really where we kind of flattened out is in Riley County that's that's where we flattened I mean you can still see Pottawatomie County is 7.31 with all the both commercial and residential growth there we were up around nine last year in Pottawatomie County and so Riley County is really where we flattened and, and a lot of it is there just isn't space for new housing and you know that kind of and within our district there isn't a lot of of available space to build so that trend probably will continue as far as Riley County is concerned but we got to the point where uh, with the all of their funds total being right at 700 million where a, a one mill is going to raise about seven hundred thousand dollars in round numbers You've seen this one before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but kind of the, the main number is towards the bottom right, and I'll blow this up and drag it over where you can see it. But we're projecting at this point a 2.9, almost $2.92 uh, million dollar increase in general fund authority, about $226,000 in supplemental general fund authority for a total of 3.145 or just under 3.146 in new monies for fiscal year 20, which is great and we're going to enjoy it and, and try and make the best use of it as we can. That number will be, in round terms, half of that the next three years. As the finance formula continues to stair step up, it'll be about half of that. This year we've got the extra bump that's added to it with Senate Bill 16 for the inflation fix, so that's why it's as large as it is. But it, like I said, it'll be, in round numbers, half. So we could anticipate, you know, about 1.5, maybe 1.55, 1.6 at most in new money if it's funded and everything stays the way it is and there isn't any modifications, which is unlikely, but we'll see, you know. That's why the court retained jurisdiction to make sure that the implementation follows in good faith. No alligator chart this time. <laughs> I still have it, but I, I didn't bring it forward. But... I think it's it's important to note the you know the upward stair step there on the right side of the chart and we're at now at 4436 we're above the 4400 which was supposed to be the base aid in 2009 and we finally crossed that threshold and hopefully we'll continue upward in the next three years as this actually with Senate Bill 423 that was passed last year this would actually the year we're going into is going to be year two of five it's a five, it'd be a five-year phase in and so we'll have 21, 22, and 23, three more years of the stair step up, and then, then it would go to the consumer price index as far as the modification of the base going forward from that point. And basically, again, around numbers, about $135 a year after this year added to the base. But that's nice to see that trend going that way. And this is with just, again, using our legal max numbers and so on, our projected numbers in that spreadsheet that kind of estimates our general fund and LOB. Again, you can see for the first time in a while, the last three years now, we're finally getting an increase in the blue. The general fund authority has is, is increased substantially, and the converse of that is true. Our local option authority is it's not shrinking but it's not growing near as much as it was and in, in relation to the general fund it's shrinking primarily because the artificial base of 4490 that's used in the calculation we're getting closer to that with at 4436 so our increase is not going to go up as much in the supplemental general fund when i first saw that calculation kind of was trying to run the estimate I'm like that doesn't look right you know we had to try and analyze it and, and figure out why is that well that artificial base isn't isn't as big a difference as it used to be. This just shows you some of the percentages and the dollar increase and kind of a little bit of a history over over time and, and it kind of that last one shows you and you know, we've been running 6.5, 5.2, 4.9 now all of a sudden we're 1.5 percent increase. Well again it's because of the big jump in the base and the less discrepancy as we were just touching on. 
the average increase over that kind of that 10, 11 year period of 5%. Well, that's a pretty good increase. But I, I say that also, you look at that, you know, 2010, we're at 25 percent. Now we're at 33 percent. So that's a big part of that increase is we put up much higher percentage on our local patrons as far as the tax tax rate. And that's the cap as well. Yeah, and 33 percent is cap. And these calculations, the things I've shown you, are, are based on the assumption that we would stay at that. We don't have to, but that's just based on that assumption at that point since we've been there the last three years. And this is just simply another way that shows that graphically that shows the dollar amount and the percentages kind of stair-stepping up in the same time period. This one, yeah, it's easier to read. I should pull the laptop out. This one shows, this is our bond and interest mill levy. Now, this is the one that's going to get a lot of attention this year. As we, as we promoted the bond and did the bond campaign last fall, the figure that was in there was a 7 point eight mil increase in bond and interest that was projected and that's that's going to happen and that's going to look like a big increase you know we're going to go from 10.6 to about 18 mils for bond and interest we've got our first interest payment due march 1st of 20 7.3 million dollars for one interest payment that's the biggest one but it, you have to have a big one up front that's just the way it's structured so we're going to see that jump and you know that's going to it's going to look like the school district is you know driving a huge tax increase we as patrons and, and taxpayers of the district voted for that last fall but now's the time when we're going to have to pay it and so it probably will get some some play i'm sure uh as we get, go on through the budget process so we're going to see a you know a good spike there that's going to be higher than we've been in recent history as far as the bond and interest mill levy but there's great things that are going to happen and come out of that. And I believe we said we needed to be bold and go for it, and we did. But we're going to have to pay the bill along the way as we go, too. And our patron supporters, which is great, and we thank them for that. This is the total mill levy uh, history. And again, you know, it's, it's been pretty flat, a little bit up and down. Uh, we'll see a spike again, driven by that, you know. I, I can't project the other ones at this point again till we get in the software and so on. We will work to try and limit the increase to what's necessary for bond and interest and try and remain flat everywhere else in the other funds uh, as much as we can and see if there's any room to, to try and manage it and do the things we need to do uh, and decrease some of those. Don't know if that's possible till we get into them and can look at them, uh, but we will try and hold that increase to what's necessary, like I said, for bonded interest. That would be our intent as we get into the, the um, details of the budget development process. And I believe that's all I have for you tonight, unless there's questions. No, good. Thanks, Lou. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, it's the end of our regularly scheduled programming tonight. We have uh, next meeting will be next Wednesday and Nick Katrina pointed out that hopefully we'll have enough. And so we will, that's why, that, how the, why the email came out. Uh, remember last year, 4th of July fell on a Wednesday. And so we had it on a different day, but anyway, so I guess we have uh, an executive session. Mr. President, I move that we go into an executive session for 15 minutes to discuss current negotiations pursuant to the exception for employer employee negotiations under the Kansas Open Meetings Act, and that we return to open session in this room at a quick five minute break. Yeah, Nine oh five. Seconded by Dave. All those in favor? Seven zero. <clears throat> so we